Sons of God. That's a term that has very specific, precise meaning in the Scripture. It's not simply a high-sounding phrase. It's a very critical reality. You won't understand Genesis chapter 6 and the flood of Noah unless you understand what the Benai Elohim, the sons of God phrase means. It refers to a direct creation of God. That term, that Hebrew term in the Old Testament is always used of angels because they were a direct creation of God. They were created even before the earth was. Okay. In fact, when you get to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. The term there is used. Why? Because it's a new creation. You and I are not sons of God in the natural. We're sons of Adam. We're sons of Adam. Adam was a direct creation of God. His offspring were sons of Adam. And that's where we are in our Adamic nature. When we accept Christ, there is a new creation. He never, rep- he never heals a broke, uh, uh, heart. He replaces it. Our heart is incurably wicked, Jeremiah tells us. That's why this born again is not just a phrase. It's a theological reality. The sons of God is a term. Here, it, it's fairly rare in this New Testament emphasis. But here's one of the places... And, of course, in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, is another place that it's really drawing what some scholars call an Old Testament idiom, if you will. But we should not expect the world to understand this thrilling relationship we enjoy, because they don't understand God, let alone this relationship. Only a person who knows God through Christ can fully appreciate what it means to be called a child of God. Don't get caught up in the brotherhood of man thing. That's humanism. Be watch out for that. Be careful of that kind of, of labeling. But here's, people ask me, what's one of your favorite verses in the Bible? And there's not just a few of these, there's a handful, but this is among them. We're going to spend a little time on verse 2. Don't panic. We're not going to spend that much time on each of the verses in this chapter. But I love verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. The first verse told us what we are. Verse 2 tells us what we shall be. What on earth is that? Are we there yet? Not quite. But what will we be? Now this was mentioned back in chapter 2 as an incentive for holy living. But now it's going to be elaborated on. Now you cannot understand this verse without a mathematical physics background. So are you ready? (laughs) <laughs> and I'm exaggerating just a little bit, of course. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This remarkable statement requires an understanding of hyperspaces. Space, what's that? That's a fancy word for spaces of more than three dimensions. Okay? So let's back up and review some stuff that you probably remember from our Learn the Bible in 24 hour summary. Stretching the heavens, the fabric of space. We think of space as an empty vacuum that's very naive and uninformed. The scripture says, speaks of God, who alone stretches out the heavens. Is that just a metaphor? Stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Stretching out heavens like a curtain spreads out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40. He has stretched out the heavens in Jeremiah 10. The Lord who stretched. This phrase occurs throughout the scripture. Is it just a poetical phrase? Or is it an insight into physics that will baffle our scientists even to this day? I could go on and on, as you can imagine that this stretching the heavens is all through the Scripture. Space, first of all, we know today, is not an empty vacuum. Any of you radio hands? Any radio hands here? You know that space has an impedance. You've got to match for an antenna and so forth. No. Space can be torn, Isaiah tells us. It can be worn out like a garment in Psalm 102. Space can be shaken, really. Hebrews, Haggai, and Isaiah all make that expression. Space can be burnt up, Peter warns us. You want to talk about global warming, Peter has a verse on that for you. It can split apart like a scroll in Revelation 6. Is that just a figure of speech? It can be rolled up like a mantle or a scroll in Hebrews and Isaiah. Now that gives us a clue here to think through a little bit. What do you mean rolled up? There must be some dimension in which space must be thin. 
in order to be rolled, right? Space can be bent, we're told. Well, if that's the case, there must be a direction in which it can be bent toward. See, those words carry some insights here. So this all implies there must be an additional spatial dimension than the ones that we directly experience in order for it to have those properties. Well, we see Paul tells us that in Ephesians. Many people miss this in Ephesians 3, verse 17 and 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ and so on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What, did you pick up on that? How many are there? Four. Four dimensions. Really? How did Paul know? Was he a physicist? I don't think so. Or is this one of these little fingerprints of the Holy Spirit editing the text for us? Be able to comprehend the breadth. Okay, the platos in the Greek. Suggesting great extent. That can be time as well as space. Length. The, the mikos, the length. And depth. Uh, bathos. And height. The uh, upsos. So, But the main point is there are four of these things. That's kind of interesting. Four-dimensional space. That's a big discovery of 20th century science. They should have checked with Paul a long time ago. But we're going to talk about hyperdimensions. These are dimensions, that's a term that mathematicians would use, of spaces more than, with more than three dimensions. We are in a hyperspace. We know we have four here, right? We're just, we've just moved beyond Euclid. In school, you learned what was called Euclidean geometry. That's something that uh, uh, is three, or, three dimensions. In 1854, George Riemann gave the most important mathematical lecture in history. On June 10th of that year, he introduced metric tensors. It took 60 years for them to be applied practically, and that's what Einstein used to develop his four-dimensional space-time that we know as the theory of relativity. And then uh, he, he, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile certain aspects of physics. But 60 years later, doing exactly what Einstein... See, Einstein realized that space couldn't be three-dimensional. So he added, by going one more dimension, to solve his problem. If he'd taken that same methodology a little further, as Kaluza Klein did in the 50s, to reconcile light and supergravity, he, would have, he wouldn't have gone to his death so frustrated. And in 1963, Yang Mills took it even further, reconciling electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces, both weak and strong nuclear forces. And the current theory, in 19, from 1984 on, is that we have not four, ten dimensions. And... Uh, uh, super strings and there's all kinds of variations of that. But what's interesting, if you do your historical homework, you'll discover that a, a Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides, he wrote in the 13th century, he concluded from his study of the book of Genesis that it has ten dimensions and that only four are knowable. And he published that in 1263. Now why am I making reference to this? Well, the great discovery of particle physicists in the 20th century using atomic accelerators is that they've discovered that we, have, we live in ten dimensions. Four of them are directly measurable. Three spatial dimensions and time. Six of them are curled in less than ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters, smaller than a wavelength of light, thus are inferable only by indirect means, but we can confirm their existence by those indirect means. So they, by spending millions of dollars on atomic accelerators, we've learned what Machmanides did by doing his homework in the book of Genesis. But there's a, I want to talk a little bit about hyperspaces just to give you a flavor of this. But there are only two kinds of people seem to be able to deal with hyperspace. And that's, of course, mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? They have no trouble with this at all. But instead of trying to take you to four and five dimensions without elaborate props and things, we can gain a lot of insight by going in the other direction, imagining a world with only two dimensions. And we're indebted to Edwin Abbott back in 1906 who developed this approach to understanding. I, want to inter I was going to introduce you to two, two of my friends. The two friends I want to introduce you to, before I introduce them to you, I want you to have compassion because they suffer from a very serious handicap. Because they live in only two dimensions. And it's Mr. and Mrs. Flat. And I want you to imagine them in a two-dimensional world. Okay? Now let's assume that we have two pieces of that two-dimensional world. Mrs. Flat, there's no way she can imagine getting to Mr. Flat in her world because she lives only in two dimensions. But if I come along as a three-dimensional being, 